Planting Creativity, Artists, Place, and Transit is a Minnesota Partnership production, a co-production of Springboard for the Arts, on the web at springboardforthearts.org, and Twin Cities Public Television. Major funding has been provided by ArtPlace. Additional funding has been provided by... Minneapolis and St. Paul have undertaken what is the largest infrastructure development in the history of the state. It's a one billion dollar investment in a new light rail corridor and it's called the Central Corridor. This is going right through the commercial heart of a city. The busiest intersection in the state of Minnesota is Snelling and University and so you can imagine when you decide to tear that up the disruption that that has. There's a sense of panic for area business owners, wondering how their shops will be impacted the next few years. There's going to be a loss of business. People avoid construction areas. People are going to move and, and businesses are going to fail and jobs are going to disappear. People have approached these development projects with sort of a very protective mindset. In creative placemaking, the conversation is completely different. It's at least an opportunity to move the neighborhood from always being in a protective stance to being able to explore wonder. How can I, as a, an artist, try to find a win-win for the businesses? I really think this is about creating a movement where artists are recognized as both makers of art, but as critical thinkers. Today, I am pleased to announce the official launch of Irrigate. Irrigate will mobilize and train artists in community development and creative placemaking and activate hundreds of artist-led projects along the corridor that benefit businesses and neighborhoods. Embed the work of the artist in the work of economic development along this corridor. Say that the artists are as important as any piece of brick, uh, any piece of mortar, uh, any of the other economic development tools. Springboard for the Arts and Twin Cities Local Initiative Support Corporation and the City of St. Paul designed the Irrigate Project. Irrigate is about this idea that all along the Central Corridor, all of those neighborhoods have assets. They have artists who live and work there already. And they just need a little bit of support, a little bit of water to really thrive and grow and really turning that into a cultural corridor and seeing if we can really parallel the physical infrastructure that's created with a parallel infrastructure of relationships between artists and community. What I really hope comes of this project is going to be a greater sense of agency and community. Right? So how is it that we are mobilizing everyday people up and down the corridor to identify themselves as artists? Secondly, how do you start to give them a sense of agency that in the midst of this billion dollar investment uh, for light rail, how can I make a difference in my neighborhood? The idea of putting art and culture at the heart of a portfolio of strategies that have the potential to transform a community is very exciting. I think too many people think about art as sort of icing on the cake. It's what you do after you've paid for everything else. This is real economic development work, so we're not playing at this. We, we need to be able to demonstrate that if you're a smart leader in your community, wanting your community to be successful, you better have artists at the table. But if you could say your name, um, how you're related to this neighborhood, so it might be that you live here or you work here, and then your art form. I use waste as a driver for design. I'm a writer. We have an entertainment management company. A lot of the people that are coming to the workshops are not sort of that range of usual suspects that you see at every grant application, informational meeting or whatever. The vast majority are people that really do actually have that live and or work connection along those um, six neighborhoods. We're going to start on, um, on the corner of Dale and University on this side, and we're just going to go one block down on... Uh... How do we help other people see this as a wonderful place? We weren't going to become experts in every neighborhood. 
So in the meantime, there are these organizations that do this work. That's their business, that's their mission, that's what they're good at. So the district council staff co-facilitate the training workshops with us. We're losing people, there's a lot of vacant homes, at the same time that there's this big public transit thing happening. A lot of times we hear, you know, just the negative stuff. We, you know, that's what, that's what makes the news. You know, so you hear about the crime, you hear about the problems around the light rail. Like, okay, we know that there's all these, these issues out there, but this is a, a positive project. My project is called Jazz on the Line, a series of four concert events at businesses and restaurants up and down the corridor. The thing that I like is just the introduction of music to venues that seems like they would have music. My village probably doesn't. They have on occasion, but not, not recently. And I, I know they're struggling right now. I don't know if you've read the articles. They're, they're maybe going into foreclosure. They did that wonderful remodel, and then the economy kind of tanked. I don't blame like uh, everything on the light rail. Besides that, you know, the economy, you can see the economy, it's never recover like the way we all hope, you know. Right now, I'm in a very, very bad situation. I can lose my place, you know, anytime. Uh, I have about like maybe nine months to go before I completely lost. Since the light rail start, every month like the, uh, the sale decrease. I don't have enough money to pay the bank. I, I don't know how I can survive. And the sad thing is that, you know, if we lost this place, it means we were going to lose our house. 37 years live here in America. What I end up, what do I have? Very soon I have nothing. Mira come and introduce herself to me, and uh, then she said uh, she would like to uh, introduce her music. First, uh, I kind of you know, hesitate a little bit because I don't know, but uh, you know, she convinced me. This is her second performance here at my village. A lot of the people around here in this community likes, you know, jazz, and so uh, they come back like today, you know, they come back. Oh, it's great. Yeah. I thought they did really <laughs> you liked it? Yeah. I thought they did really well. I don't know it before, but now I know it and I want it. And I think in the future that I may have to ask Mira and her husband that if she can play with us more. Looking forward to sort of developing these uh, connections longer term. Um, Tyler is a, a little, you know, different. He's uh, younger. We sat down at the bar and talked for about 15 minutes, and she said, yeah, great, let's do it. Oh, you can walk your space dog over here. Happy Cabaret is basically a cabaret in a restaurant. There are the acts, the cabaret acts, and then there's live karaoke. I, I'm completely surprised because, you know, we are so crowded, and people love him. I think we probably had over 100 people there, you know, that wouldn't have been there um, if we hadn't done it. So my village was the first one we did, and we've done two since then, also at Asian restaurants along University Avenue, uh, one at a Thai restaurant, one at a Vietnamese restaurant. It's opened my eyes, you know, into like uh, different than we signed to run the business. I feel there are certain businesses that are kind of like staples in the community that pass through many generations. Many generations have an opportunity to go and, and benefit from it being there. I've been here for like maybe 22 years. So I'm kind of struggling a little bit right now, but I'm still here. It's been a long-standing cultural center for the African-American community. They all call me mama, grandma. <laughs> I go along with the program. <laughs> in the great migration from the south where blacks settled in this city, they settled in this area and this was the only choice for them. And so it was an insulated neighborhood where you had a doctor, you had teachers, you had uh, factory workers, all classes of blacks living in one section of town. 
the Rondo community in St. Paul was decimated by the construction of the I-94 freeway some 50 years ago. So this idea of a huge transportation project continues to bring up questions about gentrification and who is it for and does this mean that we'll have to move and you know all of those things that is sort of like re-triggering. I've been doing Zumba here since December. We do it inside from 5.30 to 7 on Mondays. And tonight, uh, we're gonna do it uh, outside. Average is about four to six, four to eight people. Hopefully I'll do better than that today. <laughs> Hi, are you here for the Zumba? I am. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> and I wrote a song called Light Rail Shuffle, which we'll be dancing uh, to probably on this new sidewalk. It's really good exercise. And then you get to fellowship with people in the neighborhood. In the lyrics, you'll hear me say something about uh, the light rail corridors coming down the tracks. And then later I say something like, but will it benefit the people in the community this time? as a little reference to uh, Rondo. Supporting the local university of community. And I'm helping him. Yeah, just trying to keep all these businesses going. And dancing is a good way to do it. I like this outdoor thing. We might have to try this again. Yeah. We got a nice breeze going. Very nice breeze. Oh. Woo, thank you, Lord. Well, we've been out without a venue since September 2010. We lost the lease on a space in Minneapolis, which we had been in for about four years. They do work that is not only theater, but is really engaged socially. You show up to a Bedlam show as an audience member and you feel part of the event. People will often say it's theater for people who don't like theater. Being here right now feels a little bit like grave robbing uh, because it's what we're dealing with right now is the, the leftovers of the business that didn't make it here and was hit hard by the light rail construction. They invested with what they call their Irrigate Accelerator Fund in our exploration of Lower Town. We really saw the purpose of that money was to accelerate their ability to decide whether they could make this happen. Being in a place like Lower Town, which has the highest density of any artist in the Midwest, as far as neighbors are concerned, what we want to do is have a place where they feel comfortable hanging out and being themselves and getting to know people and networking and all that, but also have a space where people from outside the region can come in and do the same things. This will probably be our fourth or fifth artist and community meeting we've had in the space in the last five weeks to bring together St. Paul-based artists and our core artists. Just write thoughts, observations about the idea of performance bleeding in and out of the space into the neighborhood. We want to get an understanding of how artists would like to work, how we think it should work, and hopefully find a middle ground that um, we can move forward to paying artists a living wage, have projects that are pushing the envelope but are also high quality. Bedlam has always done a 10 minute play festival and so in St. Paul came up with the idea of trying to do it in the neighborhood and instead of it being all on one stage, kind of all being everywhere. We had individuals roaming around, leading groups of people around the neighbors to each different performance. Who knows about Bedlam Theater? Who's been to a Bedlam production? We had more people jump onto the tours than we could ever have hoped or expected to and our audience basically doubled by the beginning to the end of the night. So far, we have trained 330 artists at the Creative Placemaking Workshops. Individual artists come to our workshop, and they meet one another, and all of a sudden they have this sense of belonging. 
artists just sort of spontaneously began referring to themselves as irrigate artists as opposed to just I'm an artist but they really felt a sense of community and a sense that they were a part of something larger than just you know an individual coming to a workshop and doing a project. In the first year we've had a hundred artists who've designed and, and executed projects. The projects that we've seen from those 100 artists really break down into two types of projects. Um, the first is projects that very practically and tangibly are designed to increase business viability and business prosperity. The other type of projects are projects that really connect people to neighborhood identity, give people a sense of voice and agency, and, and really show what's possible in a neighborhood. The molecules are proof that we all are made from the same stuff as the stars. Dancing molecules, doing the tango, taking us through space. Everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> we contributed about a hundred positive media stories to the corridor. So instead of just how tough, how challenging, traffic is bad, people are angry, now there's this whole not that it's replaced that, but there's this whole additional narrative of how interesting, how fun, that seems weird. Why are, you know, look at this, where'd this come from? Before we go, benches are not just for sitting anymore. A new one in St. Paul is proving that can be musical too. Sculptor Susan Solars created this bench made out of 270 PVC pipes. Local artists like Blaine Garrett and Charles Denton find ways for you to escape. Together, those positive media stories really make up um, a new alternative positive narrative. 36 by 7 foot piece of peace. As we started looking at the column inches that were being written about those projects versus the dust and despair of construction, we started to say, my goodness, who would have thought? That really begins to make a story of a neighborhood and a story of what's possible in a neighborhood. And I think that's tremendously exciting, both locally here and in terms of how we think about creative placemaking in other communities. Uh, on my left is Laura Zabel out of St. Paul. So what can we just do today? And I am joined today by one of my good friends, Laura Zabel. All these people kind of across the country, and they're kind of looking to us to say, yeah, what are they doing in St. Paul? What's going on over there, you know? And that's exciting, and it's kind of, it's thrilling and daunting, right? But that means that the stakes were high before, but they feel even higher now. Right, for me. And congratulations to the businesses that hung on through all the construction. Let's use today as the leap forward into the future and let us have the greatest transportation network this entire country has ever seen. Thank you very much. We uh, have to give up our building last year, and so the uh, Hmong American Partnership, uh, they bought the property, and I lease uh, this back from them, so I can still run the My Village. I got a lot of support, you know, from the community. I keep thinking that I cannot let them down because, you know, they, they believe in me too much, you know, and they cheer for me. And it's like a knot in your heart, you know, when you see something like that and the appreciation we have, you know, from us to all of them. The more that we see those kinds of things, the, the more getting people thinking about their neighborhood as a positive space and thinking other people think about it as a positive space where they can come, they can spend their money, they can find a home, like all of those kinds of things. What used to be kind of like frog down, it's really rough, you know, has turned into kind of like a really um, exciting kind of scrappiness in the community. We're all in it together is, is a lot of the feeling of that uh, neighborhood and, and one that I'm really excited to see like kind of move forward uh, and, and lead the way. Rails 
she did it at Arnella's as her irrigate project, but then it's had this life. Uh, you know, when they opened the Union Depot, she performed it and taught it there. She's done it at other events along the corridor. It's really great. I'm enjoying it. We have to be proactive in fighting for our our ground or our say as, as well. Don't be passive. We're seeing that network continue on and, and really being extended to other projects. So you now have businesses that are still engaging artists after Irrigate. You have artists that, Irrigate artists that are being able to take the project that they kind of did as an Irrigate project and now use it in other places. I think one thing that has been really refreshing with Irrigate is it unearthed all of these new leaders along the, the corridor, all these artistic leaders, all of these businesses that started like building that connection between the artistic community and the business community and you know, really helped facilitate residents starting to take ownership of, of the businesses in their community. I think it's really important um, in this day and time to focus on mom and pop establishments, uh, places that are owned locally and supported by the community. Street cars to light rails. I mean, do what you do, represent, you know, hold down where you live and encourage others to come and visit and, and come and experience where you live and, and what you have to bring forth to the world. This is the beginning when traveling never fails. How we transcend from street cars to light rail. It's Friday night and you just got paid. Checking your agenda, got no plans made. Long work week, you call up the fellas, take a couple rounds down to head to Arnella's. It isn't about either putting artists on a pedestal or undervaluing, it's really saying, we need everybody in the community to bring their best talents forward. Anyone can build a light rail line. What you can't do uh, alone, and what you can't do without creative thinkers, is integrate the whole into that and make sure that the community that is around that line has input and benefits from what's going on with that line. It wasn't easy, it was so hard, but it was just so right on every single level. The difference between us coming in in 2012 and just opening, and us reaching out, networking, doing activities in and around the space made all the difference in the world. Right now, about 90% of my staff is from Lower Town, like literally within three blocks, and that wouldn't have happened two years ago. Our biggest food attraction since we've been open for two weeks is midnight to 2 a.m. That means it's local. So everybody who's coming in here and saying, oh, thank God it's finally open, I live here. I've lived here for a year. I've lived here for two years. I've lived here for 15 years. Irrigate has actually shown us the possibilities that the arts are relevant in almost every aspect of what we do, especially where there's negative disruptions. Artists can help us reweave social fabric, make communities more resilient. And where things are going well, I think it just helps you even dream and innovate and stretch your imagination even further. The biggest evolution that happened for me was the idea that instead of a silver bullet, you would use silver buckshot. Hundreds of small projects acting as catalysts in neighborhoods that had ownership over them, as opposed to one big project that made a big splash. 30 million positive media impressions were generated from these projects. So many other communities are looking at this model and saying, you know what, there's something there. Irrigate has already been asked by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to develop a toolkit, and they're already talking about sharing with communities where federal disaster declarations have been made. We started out like doing a workshop and, you know, 15 people came, and now this much time later, we've, I've met, you know, 580 artists during the course of all of those 27 workshops. With any community, there's an identity. Art is like that identity with the volume turned up. The wonderful part about it is the surprise. You think, I, I drive this route every single day and I don't believe I've seen rhinoceroses before on the side of a building. We all rush through these spaces and to have something stop us and say, wait a minute, be in this moment a little bit and, and appreciate that somebody else was here. Be where you are, live where you are, be happy where you are, create where you are. We don't have to look outside of our own 
place, if you will, our own, even our own selves to, to find solutions. It's not other people, it's not outside of ourselves. Now you have a project that made a difference, you have an artist that has a greater sense of agency, and you have a group of people that participated in that project, the creation or enjoyment of that project, that now have a completely different relationship to one another that allows them to act in a fundamentally different way to influence their community. That's the brass ring. The whole purpose of Irrigate was to build relationships and relationships that were meant to be and designed to continue without us. And I'm pretty proud that that, that has happened. Planting Creativity, Artists, Place and Transit is a Minnesota Partnership production, a co-production of Springboard for the Arts, on the web at springboardforthearts.org and Twin Cities Public Television. Major funding has been provided by ArtPlace. Additional funding has been provided by 